Okay, welcome back everybody. Natalie Cox is speaking next about linking reduced form estimates to structural models. Natalie, thanks a lot for presenting. And I think you allow questions in the middle. You're yeah. welcoming questions in the middle. Yeah, no, I definitely welcome um, any questions that you guys have if you just want to speak up. It's really nice to be able to talk to you all about this today. Um, I hope you've been having a good weekend of lectures and whatnot virtually. Um, so I'm Natalie. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Bendheim Center. And a lot of my work kind of uses uh, more like micro data um, and uh, reduced form techniques that are kind of combined also with structural models. So I wanted to talk about this a little bit today because it's something that I think is, um, there's kind of a, it's not a really um, uh, straightforward how to kind of combine these two things in some papers. So I wanted to give a little sense to all of you who are kind of going into your own research and thinking about how to combine kind of the growing amounts of really fine-brained uh, data out there in, in finance and consumer finance with some more theoretical models, how kind of someone like me would actually go about doing that and some of the, um, the mechanics behind that. Um, so the focus of the talk today is then going to be empirical methods um, that, that I think you'll find helpful to use. I'm not going to go per se through a specific kind of econometric technique or estimation technique or something like that, but rather I want to do this conceptual exercise on how you can combine the type of micro data and exogenous variation that you often might see used in more of a reduced form quote unquote paper that's running a lot of regression analyses and really trying to argue about causal uh, relationships between your X and Y variables. How can you try to combine that with also some structural models which are then trying to actually link those coefficients to underlying uh, primitives that you might have in more of an economic model so you can actually think about like what theory is is underlying those estimates and i think it's kind of you know we often see papers at kind of the extreme ends of the distribution you might see a lot of papers that are just running many many linear uh, regressions and really focused on the causality and the sign of different uh, coefficients, or you might see super structural papers where you're kind of like, okay, this is really getting at like very accurate uh, representation maybe of what we think go is going on, but I'm not quite so sure what things in the data are actually uh, identifying uh, the different parameters in that model. So I'm going to just kind of think a little bit with you about like, well, how can one maybe combine these two things to try to get like a more transparent um, estimation of these different parameters. So that's what I mean when I say uh, connect plausibly causal coefficients that you might find uh, in like a regression analysis to these parameters based in economic theory. I think this has like a lot of benefits. Um, it's even kind of a helpful way, even if you're gonna do a paper that's entirely reduced form or very structural, I think it's also just a good way to approach research because this is actually gonna help you gain a lot of insight into what primitives are actually driving those coefficients that you're estimating in a, in a regression. But the data and the variation that in labor or in public finance, you know, we really are incredibly strict about, um, it's gonna lend more credibility at the same time to your quantitative estimates that you might be getting out of a model. And you can kind of argue, no, I think they're actually coming from this part of variation in the data and not from this other kind of like underlying omitted variable. Um, so I think these techniques are kind of increasingly common in consumer finance. They were probably first explored the most. There's a lot of health economics papers in like the insurance, health insurance literature, looking at individuals choosing between different health insurance contracts that kind of bridge these two methods. And I think you're going to find them more and more in areas where we're starting to get really rich data sets, which actually allow us to observe and control for a lot of different characteristics. And that's going to allow us to do kind of a more uh, rich um, estimation. And these data sets oftentimes, too, have a lot of nice natural identifying variation that we're going to want to incorporate somehow into our structural estimates. Um, so I think it's kind of becoming increasingly common also in consumer finance, where you have all this big banking data and everything that's coming onto the um, scene. Um, so today, how I kind of wanted to do that was just walk through a, a paper, and I'm going to walk through it very quickly so I have kind of time to then actually get to the discussion of how we might link the, the different estimates. Um, but walk through a paper I have with Titan Alon and Arlene Wong. Um, they're at UCSD and Princeton, respectively. We've been doing a paper that's looking at the impact of student debt, so an individual who has student debt, on their future earnings, their income trajectories, and importantly, their occupational choices. 
So if I all of a sudden am saddled with $20,000 of student debt, am I gonna choose an entirely different kind of occupation than I would otherwise? And as it, as it sits right now, we kind of have three parts in this paper. We started out with an instrumental variables regression analysis, where we're just kind of showing that certain key relationships exist in the data. And it's an IV, so we can kind of very credibly argue, hey, the variation in debt that you're seeing in these different regressions is actually exogenous, you know, it's kind of quasi-random. And then this is what we're seeing happening as a result of that in terms of your initial earnings or your earnings growth. But then from that, we kind of build a two-period stylized model. And what I want to talk to you about today is like, how can we use that model? How can we use this IV uh, regression analysis then to actually try to estimate the parameters in that model? So there's kind of a tighter link. Between. We also have a more like bells and whistle quantitative model, which I wish I could get to today because that I think takes it one step further of kind of connecting these different methodologies. But I'm just going to keep it to the, the, the first two parts today. Um, and so to do this, I just want to focus on these trade-offs as we move from the reduced form to the structural technique. Um, sometimes with reduced form coefficients, it's kind of unclear, how do we interpret them? You know, you get a number out of your beta coefficient regressing uh, y on x or what have you. Um, but what is kind of the mechanisms or the actual parameters underlying that coefficient? And then how can we actually use those in counterfactual analysis? I think these are some of the limits of doing purely reduced form analysis. Then if we move to the simplified two-period model, you know, we're linking these things a little bit more closely to theory, but we're also forced to kind of lose some accuracy, right? Because we're going to kind of stylize things into two periods. And so it's going to be a little bit of a, a, a taste of what we're actually going to lose in terms of accuracy. And then if we move all the way to the quantitative model, you know, there's also going to be things that become opaque as we move to a fully quantitative model, as I was saying earlier. Sometimes it becomes very unclear what aspects of the data are actually informing the different estimates in a very complex model. So I think it's a good way to kind of go through those trade-offs. All right, so let me give you a brief introduction to the paper. Um, this paper is motivated by a very large rise, as I'm sure you're all kind of familiar with in the United States in student debt over time. So here we kind of see that, you know, 69 people are graduating with student debt. Um, it's been increasing dramatically over the last 20 years or so. Now the average person who actually borrowed graduates with about $30,000 in debt from just the Meeting is being recorded. Oh, was that? I heard something. Oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, the net worth also is just, you can see for people who are 20 to 22, uh, 20 to 25 year olds, there's a lot of negative net worth, which almost perfectly matches the student debt. So we have a really large uh, portion of the population graduating with a lot of debt, negative net assets, et cetera. And it takes a long time to repay these loans. So in this paper, what we're trying to ask is, well, how do these assets or debt early in life actually affect the profile of labor earnings that people experience over time. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna do this in kind of a three-step process where first we're gonna have empirical evidence on initial earnings and returns to experience that's causally linked to having additional student debt. Then we're gonna to go to a life cycle model where you have college and occupational choices with borrowing constraints. And then eventually uh, this quantitative model, which allows us to do counterfactuals about different uh, grant schemes. Um, but so as a broad overview and kind of the more data-driven reduced form regression analysis, we have a few key empirical findings that we're first gonna highlight just kind of clearly. Um, so what we're gonna do is we'll use an instrumental variable to argue that individuals with higher levels of student debt have higher initial earnings when they graduate from college, but lower returns to experience. So you can kind of think of them going into labor trajectories that are kind of front loaded and less steep than individuals who graduate with no student debt, all right? Um, and what's really interesting is that when you're playing with these regressions, when we put in something like occupation fixed effects, we found that that really soaked up so much of that variation. And so what that's kind of telling you in the regression framework is that these individuals, they aren't necessarily all becoming, you know, doctors per se, and then just within occupation changing their earnings trajectories. 
they're actually sorting into different occupations that actually come with kind of different trajectories as well. So about two thirds of that trajectory effect was due to occupational sorting and the rest was just due to within occupation uh, differences in initial earnings and returns to experience, okay? So then we take those kind of empirical facts and we say, oh, okay, well, what is the model, uh, a model that could kind of explain uh, these different um, uh, empirical findings? And so we uh, posit that credit constraints are interacting with people's human capital decisions. So they're endogenously uh, sorting into occupations which have less or more scope for human capital accumulation on the top. So what does this do? It's going to be a model where people are kind of choosing when they're young how much time to invest in their skills on the job, which is going to require giving up some income or some earnings today and then have a much higher kind of payoff in the future. So you can imagine how that would really impact the slope of your earnings trajectory. Um, but for people who are credit constrained and are graduating with student debt, all of a sudden they don't have the ability to kind of uh, backload their earnings. They need the upfront earnings in order to pay off their debt and just kind of consumption smooth. So they're almost forced to use their, uh, their occupational earnings trajectory as kind of a very crude borrowing technology in order to kind of transfer their wages from the future to the present day. All right, so that's going to kind of be modeled in our, in our model. And then from the model, you can actually do then really interesting implications for kind of what's the implications for aggregate human capital in the world? Um, what are going to be the distortions if we increase the amount of debt? What would happen if maybe we change the structure of how debt is paid down, et cetera? So you can really do some neat counterfactual uh, analysis with that. All right, so first let's go uh, through the reduced form section and what we do there. So we're using data. I'm going to go very quickly through this too, just because of time, uh, so we can get to the end. But we're going to be using um, panel data there. So it's the NLSY. You probably are all kind of familiar with this. It's a great panel data set used in a lot of applied micro, where they have followed individuals in this cohort, 6,000 individuals since they were 16. And they have asked them just about every question uh, known to man for like every year until, until the present day. And so it's one of these nice rare data sets where it's surprisingly difficult in a data set to find things like income, where you went to school, and something like student debt, especially within a panel format. So this is kind of like lending us all of those variables in the same place, which is really nice. So what would be kind of the ideal estimating equation to actually see whether student debt had an impact on these individuals' earnings trajectories? Well, we can imagine we might want to estimate something like the following equation where we have log wage or log earnings for a certain individual in time t regressed on um, their characteristics, their returns to experience, right? So that's kind of giving us the slope of their earnings trajectory because that'll change with time. But then we also might want to account for the fact that there might be a difference in debt on just the level of their earnings and also on the slope. So we would want to interact uh, experience with debt and also just have a student debt dummy in this uh, regression equation as well. Now, when you kind of have it written out this way, it's really nice when you think about regression analysis because it becomes very clear what the possible endogeneity problems might be and what bias those might be introducing to the coefficients that you're going to estimate, right? So we could think of plenty of things in your air term that might be correlated with the fact that you have student debt and also might be correlated with your earnings trajectory over time, right? Something as easy as like, you know, what type of college did you go to, a public school or a for-profit school, could easily be impacting both of these things simultaneously. So when you kind of see it in that format, not in your, in your full structural model quite yet, it's easy to think about these biases. Um, so what do you do when you have a bias in your uh, OLS? Well, you have to look for some sort of instrument. So Again, I'll gloss over this, but we found an instrument to use for this project, which is basically your age while you were in college. And if you're a specific age, if you're younger than 24, you face a, a different loan limit every year than if you're over 24. Um, so we're kind of using your birth month to compare you to people who are in very similar birth cohorts, birth month cohorts on either side, 
as kind of a treatment for whether you have a $4,000 higher loan limit uh, or not, based on your age. Now, the nice thing is you might say, oh, loan limits, what does that have to do with how much an individual actually borrows? But what we see in the data is the schools, when they're giving the financial aid packets to these people, it's kind of known as the Bennett hypothesis. They're very tricky. They kind of offset that additional loan limit in student loans with fewer grants to the individual, fewer institutional grants. So you really have this nice shifter. Here's a couple of plots of like the kind of impact of this IV where you have people who are 23 at graduation versus 24 or older than 24. This is student debt in this panel. So they're graduating on average with about $7,000 more in student debt. Um, but you can see on the flip side, it wasn't, it was kind of substituted one to one from grant aid. So they're graduating with a lot less grants. Um, so it's kind of keeping tuition and college expenditures constant, but decreasing the grant aid. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Uh, so can you speak to the exclusion restriction here? Because I remember a paper by uh, Angrist and a few co-authors where they show that uh, the quarter of birth or like, you know, the calendar month of birth has effects mm. on life because of, just because like, you know, you join the class earlier or you join the class later. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's not like a perfect IV in any sense. So we're trying to find another one as well. It's a bit hard with student debt to find a really good IV. We've tried to be as tricky as possible here because we're not just using your date of birth. It's kind of almost like a triple difference. So we're using, are you born in like uh, November, December versus January or February? That's one of the differences here. But then there's the second difference is, are you graduating by the time you're 24 or 23? So we're kind of differencing out the month effects as well, because you kind of are stacking it on top of each other. It's kind of a, a triple difference, if that makes sense in terms of the IV. But no, definitely. I think. I think going through and being very um, hard and rigorous about the uh, assumptions on your instrument are incredibly important too. Like I'm not gonna go through all those as much, <laughs> much on this, uh, this talk, but I think that's why you can have some papers that are entirely devoted just to kind of doing a really good instrumental variables regression, you know, and not attempting them to also do all this other stuff as well. Okay. So just to kind of, you know, when we put in that IV and we actually get out our regression coefficients, what do they look like? So remember, we're instrumenting student debt with this kind of like date of birth slash year of birth instrument. And what we find is that as, um, you know, we were kind of, well, actually, this, this was our first findings and then the model kind of like uh, supports this. But we found that these people with more debt, when they graduate in their initial occupation or their initial job, they have about 2.3% uh, higher initial earnings than individuals who did not. But as time goes on, they have a lower uh, returns to experience, okay? So they kind of have these Latin trajectories as we were talking about, all right? And so you can kind of think about this. We did some simulations. These are just the coefficients, but if you kind of um, extrapolate these on the means of the different samples, the earnings profiles will kind of cross for these two groups with and without student debt after about six years, okay? And on whole, what you're kind of seeing is that these people with student debt are choosing these flatter earnings profiles, and in net present value, their earnings are less, but they're willing to kind of sacrifice that in order to have the front-loaded trajectory, if that makes sense, because they're more credit-constrained in the moment. Natalie? Right away. Yeah. So, so you're interpreting this so far as, as kind of in terms of these occupational trajectories, right? So I'm, I'm just wondering, can you rule out that people who are entering with debt in the, in the job market or in, in early on, they just work more and so they have less time to like have invest into like their human capital on the job? Totally. So that's yeah, kind of then our... You can have just like trajectories, different differential trajectories just based on this and yes. it would be yeah. kind of a very different model you would think of, right? Totally. So I keep using the word occupation. That's just because on this next slide, I was going to tell you. So these coefficients right here don't have any occupational controls in there at all. We're just kind of pooling everyone. The only reason we started thinking a little bit more about occupations is that when you do put in the occupation fixed effects in the regression analysis, you still have a similar, um, uh, a similar sign on these different coefficients but it's much smaller. It becomes actually insignificant on the returns to experience, but I think we have some power issues here. 
But this was leading us to think, and I think you have a great point in the model, it's gonna reflect this if I get to that. There's both a within effect, which is kind of that on the job substitution uh, effect that you're talking about, right? I'm just gonna kind of change how much I invest today. But there can also then on net be a, a cross job kind of switching effect across occupation. And this is really important when we think a little bit more about like identification and moments that we can use. But yeah, definitely, they're both in there, 100%. Okay, so to summarize that, you know, it's not a super complex uh, reduced form part, but we have this variation. It's showing us student debt leads to higher initial earnings, lower returns to experience, and that the initial occupation choice accounts for about two thirds of that effect, right? And the rest is within occupation. So, you might come from this and say, even like the question we just got, you know, well, how can we kind of interpret these coefficients in a model? There's a lot of different stories that we can tell. We might want to actually put some structure on this, and then we can think more about implications for welfare and policy, especially since we all know there's just a million new policies out there for student debt and how people might be able to kind of repay in different ways. So we might want to play with that a bit. So in that case, then we, we're next going to go to a stylized model. And I do think this is kind of a good way in your own research to think about these things sometimes. You know, start with this and don't go straight. You don't have to go straight to a really accurate, complex model. You can first just go to a more stylized model, which is trying to highlight uh, just the key mechanisms. And it'll be, it's kind of harder in some ways to write one down that doesn't have all these like different bells and whistles, but it can really give you a lot more clarity about the mechanisms that you want to highlight. So in our model, we're going to basically have occupations. We saw they played a big role in our reduced form analysis. So we'd like that to play a big role in the model as well. So we're going to have K occupations that an individual can choose from, and they're going to vary on kind of two dimensions here, okay? So first, there's going to be a different wage, an effective wage per human capital, which is going to vary by occupations. So that's just going to be kind of giving us different levels of wages. But it's also going to have this interesting uh, variable called VARFI K. <laughs> my Greek letters, I'm learning <laughs> VARFI, that one's called. Uh, VARFI K, which is the maximum amount of human capital that can be accumulated in this occupation, okay? So this one's kind of a little tricky, but it's basically saying if I put, you know, if I tried the most I could to accumulate more on the job skills in this certain occupation K, it has some sort of maximum limit to that, okay? I can train all I want maybe as a, a taxi cab driver, but it just has less like room for improvement than maybe if I was like a pilot of an airplane. I don't know. Okay. We're going to remain agnostic about what the source of that is, but there's just this occupational specific uh, slope capacity. Now on the household side, as I said, it's going to be stylized. So here we only have two periods. Later we can introduce a whole life cycle, but you have young and old households. And people are born with some degree of heterogeneity. So they're going to have their initial assets that they're born into. And they're also going to have a vector of epsilon IK, of occupational talent. So that's reflecting the fact that I might be much better as an economist than as an artist or something like that. And that's specific for every single person. Now, they've already chosen, they're going to choose uh, how much they want to spend on their initial human capital. So you can think of this E as being their expenditure on college, for example, like uh, tuition or something like that. Um, and they're also going to choose their occupation that they go into. And they're going to receive outside funding for education, which is G. So G is going to denote grants. So one thing that we're doing here, right, is we're going to say, well, if tuition is E, grants are G, loans, which is the thing that we have in our kind of regression analysis, is going to be E minus G. And that's kind of the thing that you can kind of connect right away to what we were already doing earlier in the paper, all right? Now, when I'm young, I'm going to be choosing my on-the-job training. Uh, it's kind of a Ben Carath model. So you can look at the evolution then of human capital and earnings. Um, when I'm young and I've just graduated from college, my human capital is a function, human capital in a certain occupation K, it's a function of my talent in that occupation K and also how much educational investment I made. Um, and that means my earnings are going to be uh, determined partially by that human capital level. But I also have a choice variable within my earnings function, right? I can decide whether I want to take more time today 
in my new job to actually do on the job training. And the more on the job training that I choose, the higher S, the lower my young person, my current period earnings are gonna be, okay? So this is kind of playing around with that slope level issue, right? Um, because the thing is that S is gonna now show up actually in the next period when I'm old. So when I'm old, I now have a new level of human capital and it depends on that S. So if I invested a lot when I was young, I chose a big S when I was young, it's gonna give me lower earnings as a young person, but as an older individual, I'm now gonna have more human capital on this job accumulated and I'm gonna have higher earnings there. So that's kind of gonna be like a nice a way to, that we could shift around um, these different earnings. Okay? And it kind of gives us a nice, all of a sudden we can already take this and come up with a formula for our returns to experience. Uh, for an individual. And it's going to be very much uh, a function of that SIK that I choose on that specific job, and also the VAR VK, which was that occupation specific capacity for human capital investment. All right? Sorry, Natalie, just a quick clarification question. Yeah. Human capital that you expect, you, your expenditure on human capital, it can be uh, occupation specific then, right? Because there's a sub. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So we played around with this a couple of times. I think. This is kind of like you would know in your head, I'm going to then go into this occupation, so you would change it. But I think in a later version, we've also made it uniform. So these are all little choices you can see that you can make along the way. And when we actually go to the, um, to the identification portion, you're going to see that the more things, so like even looking through this slide, right, you can kind of say to yourself, if I had a data set, what are going to be the things here that I could actually nail down in the data versus the things that I'm gonna have to somehow identify as parameters or calibrate into like what are also just gonna be the equilibrium outcomes that are gonna come out of this, right? And so you can kind of see here right away, you can make it more or less complex for yourself depending on how many extra kind of parameters you wanna put into your model, okay? Um, so looking at this, right, we have RTE was something that we just saw in the data in our, in our reduced form analysis. So at least I have this in the data. Um, the uh, bar fee K is probably going to be a parameter then that I have to actually estimate for every single occupation. The theta is going to be something I have to estimate for each occupation. And this SIK is going to be kind of one of these optimized equilibrium outcomes that the model is actually, I can kind of solve for in the model. Um, I think that's also a good thing in your head, always to kind of be keeping track of, because sometimes when you have a lot of different parameters and a lot of different, you know, moments and whatnot, you can almost sit there and say, wait, what is what do I actually observe from the data and what's going to have to be something I actually have to kind of chase after? Um, um, hi, yeah. Natalie. A uh, quick yeah. question there. So, for instance, if I want to reduce down the parameters I want to estimate from a model, mm -hmm. is it okay to uh, substitute some of the reduced form estimates into the parameter and give an argument for that? Or yeah. that generally doesn't happen? Well, that's the tricky thing. So that's what I kind of want to get to, right? Is that it can what you can do is you can try to use those as one more moment that you're going to estimate. They actually provide one more moment, right? So I'll get to that at the end, definitely. It's often difficult though, if you sat down and did the math, it's often difficult to just get a one-to-one -one mapping from your exact uh, coefficient that you get out of the OLS. What is that actually? Here it would be the change in returns to experience with respect to the change in debt. What does that exactly mean in terms of the parameters of my model? You would actually have to kind of map that out and write that down. And it's hard to actually get an analytical solution uh, to that in the terms of your model, unless it's very simplistic. But that's exactly where we're headed, is how can you kind of do that? Because it's a nice link that then you can have between the two different analyses. Thank All right. you. Yeah, of course. So, so that's kind of your human capital investment within a specific job. Then what is the, um, the uh, I'm gonna go through this pretty quick because I've only got about, okay, I've got 30 minutes, we're fine. Okay, so then we have the household's problem. They're also choosing not only their on the job human capital investment, but also over occupations as well, right? And so what they're kind of doing, it's almost a discrete choice problem that's kind of loaded in as well to this continuous choice problem is they're gonna look over all these different occupations. For every occupation, they're gonna be calculating their lifetime utility, their optimal human capital investment on the job, et cetera. And then, um, this might be in two slides. Then they're actually gonna kind of choose 
amongst all of those, what is the occupation K star that maximizes uh, their utility out of all of those possible occupations, okay? So let me go back though here really quick. Um, so we have our consumption and our human capital equations here that they're solving for each job. So what I wanted to do here was go really quickly through what you were saying about the within versus across occupation effects and how we're trying to kind of capture those uh, in the model. So an individual's choices within a given K that they're going to maximize include their human capital expenditure, the EIK, their time investment on that specific job, which is all specific for K. Um, and then we can use, we can write for that specific uh, job then as a function of these things, what are their initial earnings, for example, and what are their returns to experience. Now the important thing to note here, which is important in terms of like the different groups that you're kind of uh, solving this for, is you have your Lagrange multipliers in here. We had a borrowing constraint. I don't know if you remember this on the first slide, but we had also a borrowing constraint. Some people, even after they graduate from school, they still have access to funds that they can borrow at a certain interest rate, okay? And so for them, all of a sudden, it's not really gonna be constrained whether I already have student debt and I need to actually use this trajectory to kind of front load my wages or you know pass them between the future and today. If I'm unconstrained, these things are gonna be equal to one and I'm basically going to have um, certain expressions for my human capital investment, my time investment, my returns to experience, and my initial earnings that are a function kind of of the VAR VK, a function of theta, which is the returns to human capital investment, but aren't really going to be at all a function of my student debt or anything like that. So S and RTE will be the same across individuals within an occupation. All right. So you're gonna have certain very nice kind of closed form expressions when these two Lagrange multipliers kind of cancel out in a way or they're, they're equal to one plus R. When those are, when you're dealing with an unconstrained person, you're gonna have really nice analytical solutions for the IE and the RTE, okay? Which is nice, those are like nice moments. So just keep that in your head as we get to the identification part. If we instead are dealing with a constrained individual who cannot borrow, who doesn't have access or has access to kind of more expensive um, uh, funding, for them all of a sudden, you're actually gonna have totally different effects going on in this model. So they're gonna have lower E, they're gonna invest less in their initial human capital, and they're also gonna have lower S, which means they'll make lower time investment on the job in terms of the human capital. So we're just kind of playing around with this. Um, and they're actually going to have a much more, this is still for the unconstrained guys, sorry, but they're going to have a much more kind of complex, uh, it's still analytical formula in this specific scenario, but they're going to have a much more complex kind of formula for their initial earnings and their returns to experience. Okay. Um, so going here, when we look at our occupational choice, um, for the unconstrained individuals, their kind of uh, utility that they're getting from a certain occupation is going to be a function then. So this is where you can kind of take all of those kind of large equations and boil them down to what parameters are involved in this specific uh, equation, okay, or the specific utility function, for example. So for the unconstrained individuals, they had kind of these meter choice probabilities or these meter uh, utility um, functions. And so their utility for a given job K is going to be a function of the wage of that job, the trajectory of that job, eta, which is the returns to your initial human capital and your talent, uh, theta, which is the returns to S, R, and beta. And when we make this assumption on the error term, um, which is a Frechet distribution, so this is another thing where it's kind of like you have to make a lot of these in order to if you're striving to have anything kind of come out in a nice form or kind of a nice, uh, <laughs> like a nice little equation or analytical equation, there's these certain tricks that you start to learn as you've written down a couple of these. And one is kind of the distributions on the air terms. A lot of times you have people using logit air terms, crochet terms as well, kind of do this, but in a multiplicative way. They kind of give you a nice choice probability for, okay, I'll choose that job above all the other jobs. If you, this is an aside, but I always like, this threw me off a lot in grad school because 
you know, really with an air term, you could choose any sort of distribution, right? You could choose normal, you could choose anything like that. The thing is though, it's going to give you then when you're choosing like, a, like what is the probability with that distribution? I choose this job over this job. It'll give you this really kind of messy, potentially not analytical solution for the choice probability. And that only becomes a problem. First of all, it's not very like transparent when you write it down. It's not very easy to carry around, but it also can come, become pretty computationally difficult as well. So I think that's kind of the argument for sometimes you see people always using these same kind of um, distributions. It's just a lot more computationally um, uh, acceptable. All right, so that's for the unconstrained individuals. For the constrained individuals though, those same uh, utilities that they have for these different jobs, it's similar to these guys, but I told you it was a messy formula. It also involves their uh, talent in that specific occupation, the amount of grants that they had. So ding, ding, this is gonna lead us back to our reduced form equation, right? Because now I actually have grants and student debt entering into their decision of which job they're going to enter into and also their initial assets. All right, I'm sorry this is so fast, but you guys can look through these again and, and maybe it'll make more sense. I'll post them all uh, in more detail. All right, so this is what I really then wanted to get to was a little bit more the identification discussion. So what did we kind of go through here really quickly? We went through first like these regression analysis. That was nice because hopefully it gave you a little more uh, credibility or gave me more credibility in terms of the signs of the effect that I was showing you, right? It was kind of this nice linear format. We could really think about the exclusion restriction, et cetera. Um, the model, on the other hand, it's actually providing a little more intuition for why we see the coefficient of a certain side in the regression analysis, right? So why do we kind of see these effects? So then you might ask, well, is there, you know, I could just plot both of these in a paper and have them be totally separate, but is there a way to kind of link the two more directly during the estimation? I think the takeaway there is, yes, there's actually many ways to do that, but it requires some thought and creativity. And it's very much kind of, I think it's a really fun thing when you're doing these papers. And I think it's really fun, especially when you're doing something like working on your job market papers or something like that, to try to take these things one step further. Um, but it's just important to know there's not necessarily a right way. There can be many ways to make these linkages. Um, so it's really, in some ways, it's kind of a, a matter of taste. So as we go into this, I first wanted to think a little bit about like, how do we use this word identification? Um, so when we're thinking about a model, structural model, oftentimes I think of the word identification as, okay, I might have five unknowns, so I'm gonna need at least five equations to pin down my five unknowns, right? So in my model, that means I'm gonna need to come up with five different moments in the model that involve the different parameters and I'm gonna need those five moments somehow that I can match in the data, just so I can actually have them be identified in the truest sense of, you know, I don't have multiple solutions for these different parameters, right? So that kind of like is one way to think about this in more of a structural sense. And I think what that often does is then, it means I'm kind of relying on matching like maybe means in the data or levels in the data and means and levels in the model as well. But even in that sense, you have a lot of freedom in terms of what means or what levels am I gonna choose in the data and in the model. Now, when we think instead about causal identification, if you were more like a microeconomist or something, and I said the word, is that identified? You would think, oh, this is all about kind of exogenous variation and using that to estimate parameters and making sure those parameters are kind of uh, cleanly identified and we've, we've stripped off all the omitted variable bias and the endogeneity and all this different stuff. Um, and so I think one way, and this was kind of a question that we had earlier, it would be nice to kind of combine these two things in a sense, but I think it's still good to kind of know how different people use the word identification. Um, but you might even think about using causal identification in combination with the structural identification of saying, hey, could I maybe, can one of my moments maybe that I'm gonna match be like this derivative that I just estimated in my OLS, right? It's kind of like the, the derivative of Y with respect to X. Maybe I can actually match the derivatives in the data in the model that are induced by this exogenous shifter that I actually think is credibly exogenous. So going back to our example, what 
how, how would we kind of go about this and how do we decide what moments, et cetera, to match in order to do estimation? Well, first it's good just to do your bookkeeping. So like I was saying earlier, you would go through your model and say, okay, what are the actual parameters that we need to estimate here? What are things that are just gonna, you know, come out of the estimation routine and that we can't have in the data? Um, so I've written down the main uh, parameters that we need here. And they were, there are these returns to experience, kind of the curvature functions on the, on the job training and the human capital investment. There are those slope and earnings, occupation specific characteristics. Um, and there are also the, the talent distribution, right? So we had to make an assumption about the distribution of talent. We said it was a Frechet shade distribution. So once you choose a distribution, then you have the parameter that you're gonna to need to estimate is the one governing the mean or the variance of that distribution. So here we're gonna call that sigma. So if you added those up, we're gonna need about two times K plus three moments. Um, one way that you could always kind of play around with this, right, is you could say, well, maybe I actually want to parametrize one of these, like the ones where I need K occupations. Maybe I'll actually parametrize var phi K if it's kind of continuous in some sense along the occupation distribution or something like that. But I don't know. That's just like a one way in which you could, you could change this a little bit. And that becomes important when you're thinking about power of your data and like how much power you have to estimate for. So you kind of take stock of, okay, what are my different parameters that I need to estimate? How many are there? And then you can turn to kind of the more creative part, which is saying, well, what are the different sources of variation that I have in my data set, all right? So we've kind of gone through the model, all of us, and thought a little bit about, I'm using the word variation here, but I want you to think about like, what are the different distinguishing factors in terms of moments and different uh, things like that? So what do we have kind of in our model that we've already written down that might be sources of different moments? We need 2K plus three moments at least to estimate this. Well, one thing that we saw was that constrained and unconstrained individuals had very different outcomes, right? Like they had totally different formulas in terms of their uh, initial earnings and their returns to experience. So that might be one way in which, right, I could kind of generate more and more moments. I could do initial earnings for constrained and unconstrained, returns to experience for constrained and unconstrained, and I have four moments, for example. But then you always have to think, okay, what are we do the downsides here? Well, I'm calling these people constrained and unconstrained. That's something in the data that can be hard to define, right? I don't necessarily, there's not a variable in my data set that says, okay, this guy has you know, access to credit and this guy doesn't. So that would be something I have to proxy a little bit. Maybe I, maybe I feel comfortable doing that in my data, maybe I don't. All right, another source of variation was the one that we started with. So we might really wanna use this to kind of tie everything together. That was the instrumental variable. What does that do in terms of my model? How could I use that as a moment? Well, the IV was exogenously shifting student debt in my regression analysis. And so in the model, that would be analogous to shifting that E minus G component in my model. So if I come up with a moment in the model, which is some derivative with respect to the EG, either initial earnings or returns to experience, that's the exact moment that would match up with my regression coefficient. Um, there was also the variation that happened within occupation versus across occupation. Uh, effects, right? So we separated those two as well in the model. We had different moments for those things, different parameters in different moments, determine them. And so that would kind of line up, for example, to maybe um, looking at uh, moments that happen, like differences in returns to experience within a certain occupation versus across occupations, right? So that's like kind of more variation that we could use. Even here, we can think about different outcome variables. So initial earnings versus returns to experience. They were totally governed by different parameters and different moments. And there are two main coefficients or two main outcome variables in the regression. And then finally, one that you might also think, which is kind of more of a means uh, sort of a um, moment, would be the proportion of people that we see in every single occupation. So that was one of our kind of outcomes, right? Once we assigned the distribution to the epsilon, um, we all of a sudden had these equations that kind of gave us the probability that a certain number of people would go into each of the K occupations. And that was different for constrained and unconstrained individuals. 
So it's almost like we could match shares, right? I could observe the share of people who are doctors in the data and match that then to the share, the predicted kind of written down share uh, from the model. And that would be like another kind of uh, moment. Um, so obviously you could kind of see from this, this is just the subset of all the moments. There's kind of infinitely many moments that you can choose. And so when you come down to something like that, you might think, oh gosh, I really thought 2K plus three parameters was a lot of parameters, but there's actually even more kind of moments that it's up to me to kind of choose then which ones do I want to use to kind of inform my model? Do I want to really just rely on this like exogenous variation? Or am I kind of like confident enough with some of the cuts of the data and confident enough in my model's assumptions that I might use that kind of in combination with something like the proportions of people, the shares of people that I see in different occupations or whatnot, okay? So you can think then a little bit more in detail about uh, how this would work. So I'm gonna go to the first one that I had here, the constrained versus unconstrained individuals and think about that a little bit more. So in terms of our model, we had the constrained individuals, their initial earnings in the model were a function of these various parameters plus the E minus G, okay? The returns to experience was a function of these parameters as well as the E minus G. The E minus G is student debt. For the unconstrained individuals, you can see that they were different, they were entirely different moments. And importantly, they didn't rely on the E minus G. So this is where we're gonna think about some of these little trade-offs that come into, come into play. So if I wanted to use kind of my unconstrained versus constrained dimension of the data for my uh, identification, the only issue is that I cannot use the unconstrained guy at all in conjunction really with my, uh, my exogenous variation or my IV, right? Because their choices, my, models are, my model is saying, don't, aren't affected by student debt. So I should really just kind of, those aren't gonna be able to be used at all in conjunction with instrumental variables, only the outcomes kind of for these constrained individuals. So I now know, okay, if I'm gonna make that choice, I'm gonna kind of cut down my sample size too. I'm gonna to lose a little power uh, if, I, if I'm kind of using my IV to just the constrained individuals. All right, oops, I can't see my slides. Oh, um, so if we wanted to though, and we were really just like, I really wanna use my instrumental variation, I'm an identification stickler, I want exogenous variation, we could turn just to the constrained population um, and then we might say, okay, so I'm gonna use my constrained population. And now I'm gonna use another source of variation because this is only gonna give me maybe two moments right here. If I looked at initial earnings and returns to experience, I'm gonna look at kind of within versus across occupations, all right? But here's another kind of table, which is gonna say, so now I'm looking just at the moments for constrained individuals only, but I'm gonna look at what happens in terms of my, um, formulas for their initial earnings and their returns to experience within occupation, that's all conditional on a specific bar VK versus across occupation, which is not like conditional on any specific bar VK, it's rather gonna be taking into account both the across occupation jumps and the within occupation jumps. Um, so I'm gonna look at my time just in case there's, I think I have enough time. So what would be like this across within occupation strategy? Well, I can still use my IV, right? I'm dealing with the constrained population. So it has an E minus G component in the, um, in the equations. And my moments therefore should kind of focus on the derivative of the initial earnings or the returns to experience functions in the model to the EG. So as we've said before, that's kind of in our regression equation, that our shifts are right there. Um, so I, I drew a really bad picture, <laughs> sorry, but I just wanted to, <laughs> I didn't have time to uh, make it in the text. Um, but you can see in this picture, what is this kind of doing? So we have different occupations. Um, here is our, so you can think of this on the y-axis as being returns to experience, for example. And on the x-axis, we have E minus G, which is the amount of student debt that you had. Now, if we're looking occupation by occupation and we ran our regression occupation by occupation, 
the regression is kind of assuming that these things are linear, right? So we kind of have lines. This is another nice thing of using the model because in the model, we're going to calibrate it at a specific point linearly, but it's actually going to build in some curve at some point. Um, but for example, if var phi k equals one or if occupation k equals one, and we ran our IV within that specific occupation, then we're going to have a specific uh, coefficient. That would be this thing on, on the left-hand side, right? That'd be our coefficient, our beta hat. And that we would say in our model is going to equal some function of the parameters, which is our derivative with respect to the parameters. And we would have another one of these within occupation if we looked at occupation two and took the slope for occupation two. That would match another moment. So you can see really easily, I could have k regression coefficients, one for every single occupation, k moments in my, in my model, and I'd take care of at least, um, if I do that for initial earnings and returns for experience, I'd have now two k moments. And it's all kind of stemming at least from my instrument. So that would be like a very kind of like, even with your IV uh, for getting your identification in the model. Natalie, sorry, can I add to yeah. So if you do this, so if you think of this in, in terms of like um, simulated method of moment thing where you run these regressions in the data and you also run the same regressions in your model. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, so because in the regressions you showed before, you would include my other controls, right? You would include beta, axis, and, and things yeah. like that. So you don't have them in your model, right? I, I'm just wondering, so. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how that would go. In because I, I guess that feeds back into what you, the distinction you made between structural identification and kind of this causal identification. Yeah. If you control for all of these things in the data, it's fine because that gives you causal identification, right? And you, yeah. you would be more robust to like misspecification. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of how I would do this here. You would want to put in your controls as well in terms of like the moment uh, that you would get out of the model. So you would have think about it. Here would f as a function. I think it would be the means because you're kind of your. So so I mean more yeah. simply, like if you if you don't have controls, what you could have is. In a different context, you could have many fixed effects, right? Yeah. And many yeah. of these, like you don't have even, you don't have these dimensions in the model, so you could mm -hmm. include the fixed effects, but they they don't do anything, right? Yeah, you might so want to like case, you're actually true because you're running the same regressions, right? It's just yeah. that the fixed effects are not doing the same thing, but yeah, you might want to residualize. I'd have to think a little bit. This is also a tricky thing. You might want to residualize the data that you're using in the model for a lot of like these individual specific characteristics. And then just kind of match more of like your basic, like, you know, beta to, to the one uh, derivative in the model. So that's a good point. This is another thing that's always kind of unclear exactly how to do it. Because you might also say, okay, I'm going to just do my regression coefficient kind of at the means of the population and then match it to just kind of the mean derivative in the model or something like that. And that would be like another. Because like this derivative that you would have here, yeah, you could do it conditional on a whole bunch of different characteristics as well. Um, but some of them aren't necessarily showing up as different parameters in the model. So yeah, this is another thing that you would have to <laughs> So I mean, a related question, sorry for um, uh, doing another question. So the, um, I'm just wondering, so another so if, if you if you stay stick with this distinction between causal identification and structural identification yeah one alternative to like the causal identification you showed is having actually statistical tests in there that uh, um, let you reject the model right that's true where, yeah. and so i'm just wondering whether i mean this is this could be combined right where you have exactly yeah. where you residualize the data but in the yeah. end you check whether the residuals do anything whether they that's change true. anything and so if, if you, yeah, so you, yeah. So. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. I like this, yeah. There, I feel like there's a lot of different tests that you can kind of do. It's just, it's moving you more and more away from this like kind of thing of like, well, I think my model is the right model. I think my model is the data generating process. So I don't really have to think about kind of all this misspecification or something like that. And I think, yeah, I think you actually, you're bringing up a really good point too, which is, I'm plotting, I'm telling you all these different methods of kind of like actually matching the, the, these as moments and having it actually inform your parameters. But a totally different approach that you could take is say, hey, I'm actually just gonna do a more, I'm gonna use more, um, let me go ahead here really quick. 
I'm going to use something like the unconstrained population, which has really nice analytical solutions for all these different things as my moment population, okay? And I'm just going to come up with like, what's the average uh, initial earnings? What's the average returns to experience? I'm going to match that to the data. There's no variation that's coming from any like IB or anything like that. It's more like a traditional maybe I think it's still like a little bit of a more thoughtful way of matching your moments than just kind of putting it in like a black box and picking something out. You might do all that, but then you might also say, okay, once I've estimated those parameters, I can simulate kind of this regression coefficient that I have for my IV. And I can use that kind of as a check or something like that to actually see if it's creating the same um, results that I'm getting uh, in my kind of more causal uh, platform. So it's also can be like an external check. And I think that's also like a valid way of using this. That's kind of a nice way to link the two. Um, all right, so I'm gonna, I have three minutes. So I had a whole bunch of slides going through the rest of the parameters. Um, but I think like to kind of summarize, you can go on and on forever. I think what you're kind of solving for when you do this sort of exercise is that obviously there's a lot of choices to make. Um, what should we try to aim for? And so I think this is a bit of personal taste, but I think transparency is incredibly, um, it's kind of elusive, but it's a, very, it's a very important thing to kind of look for. It's easy to write down a very opaque kind of complicated model. It's much harder to kind of write one down that's more transparent, uh, especially at the estimation stage of things, and that has kind of a clear um, identification argument, right? And so on transparency, this often comes into play when you're thinking about like analytical moments. Um, because you can get a lot of like we were even talking about our assumptions on the air term, right? You can get like maybe something that's just like a I'm sorry, what is the numerical? It only has a numerical solution. Um, but the nice thing about analytical, you might at sometimes make like a a choice that's kind of sacrificing some accuracy just so you can get like an analytical solution because it is very clear to the reader or to the person kind of, oh, this is the exact effect of that parameter on this kind of observable outcome. And this is the comparative statics and it kind of just makes it all very transparent. So sometimes I think that's like a very a good thing to trade off or aim for. Um, we're also trying to find some way to use our causal variation in the data in terms of uh, estimating the model. You want sometimes intuition too. So I think it's really nice to be able to write down in your, for yourself or even in the paper as part of your estimation section, what's the intuition behind my identification strategy? I'm trying to maybe get these parameters out of variation in the data that they kind of intuitively link to, you know? So I might not want to use something like, um, I'm trying to think, like choice probabilities to get something totally random that like doesn't relate to it at all. It, it would seem like quite a stretch. So sometimes you want a clear link between the moments and the parameters. And then finally, which is potentially the most important one, you can have a lot of beautiful ideas and creative ideas. Like we just went through, oh, I could have K moments for K different regressions. But if you simply don't have the power from the data, a lot of these things are infeasible in practice. And you might just be forced to kind of only get two of your moments from the IV and the rest out of these other like levels or means in the data just because it was a small sample or your um, IV doesn't have enough power. Um, so I wrote down like a couple different approaches just to show you these are all like different combos of different strategies that I could use for this particular um, model uh, that's incorporating these different things. And, you know, there's many, many more. So it's kind of, sometimes it's a little daunting, but I think if you find the one that you like, it's actually quite uh, rewarding and a fun part of doing a paper. Um, so I wrote down my personal taste on how I would do this, <laughs> but, you know, that's just like one person's uh, taste. And I think like the important thing on this too is like, you, I think by going a little further beyond just doing maybe a reduced form um, analysis of something, like you do have to take a stand on certain things. You have to make certain assumptions. You have to make a certain decision of what variation that you want to use. And so those things can sometimes, they open you up also for a little bit of criticism because as, as you can see, there are so many different options that you can do and people have very different tastes I've found. Um, in terms of what they would have used to estimate something. So it's kind of interesting to 
like I think it's for that reason it's worth really thinking through these sorts of things when you're estimating a model because you'll get a lot of questions well why didn't you use that to estimate that or why didn't you parameter and so it's good to have really thought through it so that you have a really good answer for these things and you can kind of argue why you made the specific choices that you made uh, in your project. Um, and this was some methods of estimation. But I think I'm just at 5, 545, 557, 547. So um, I'll go ahead and stop. And uh, I don't know, Marcus, should I, uh, is there another thing now or questions or whatever you want? Yeah, we can do a little bit of questions. Can you hear me? Um, it's up to you, but otherwise we can go to your tribe and then uh, meet on your tribe. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, you can always email me too or anything. Um, well, let's do one or two questions now here and then uh, the remaining ones on your tribe. Marcus, couldn't we just stay here, the people who wanted to ask more questions and then people who want to That's leave fine. your tribe? That's also fine, if uh, Natalie is okay with that. Yeah, sure. Um, Natalie, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So generally in health economics and when we have questions like about cars or cereals, we observe the entire choice set, right? Yeah. But in finance, like in banking or like household finance, we just observe what the firm chooses or what the consumer chooses. Mm -hmm. So in your setting, how do you get around that? Like how do you estimate your choice set? Or do you see it in the survey or your data? I see. So in terms of the occupational choices that they're making? Yeah. Uh, yes, like when you're fitting in, when you're calculating the choice probabilities. Yes. So we actually just went ahead. We actually, um, I guess we, you can always kind of make some sort of a, like categorization that kind of includes the whole choice set. So occupations are kind of uh, nice for this because what we could do is we could actually, we did see the occupation everyone in this survey went into. You kind of then have to group, it was nice. So we saw the whole like distribution of choices. We do always then have to kind of throw in the outside option, which is like, I'm just not going to work or I'm not going to go to college or something like that. So that kind of becomes your like other additional null choice. Um, but then it just came down to kind of aggregating occupations in a specific way because yeah there's like a million occupations out there at some point you're splitting your sample too finely if you wanted you know a thousand different choice probabilities so like you know we use cps codes down to the second um uh the second digit or something like that to kind of categorize those and then you have a whole set of choice probabilities but I think maybe your question is saying, okay, you sometimes have to like create for all of the people who are uncategorized somewhat of an outside right. option or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you a question because I'm, I'm actually really interested in the paper and you focused on the technical uh, part, which was super yeah. useful, but I wanted to get uh, more on, on the motivation or what kind of counterfactuals are you interested in analyzing with it? Or? Yeah, no, it is a cool paper. It's, um, there's been a lot of, I mean, I think it kind of motivates a lot of public policy uh, surrounding student debt because I think there's a big worry. It's often referred to as like a crisis in student debt, but I think a lot of this worry is that it's kind of not only distorting people's like additional borrowing choices or mortgage choices, but also kind of their earnings choices as they get older, their occupational choices. And that's why you have things like public service loan forgiveness programs or income-based repayment, right? Because we kind of don't want to distort these, these uh, choices. So I think it's a it's kind of an interesting question. And I'm we've been going around a lot on the different counterfactuals because of course some of them that you could do is say, okay, what would happen if the government maybe changed from loans to grants? This, for example, is one that we've been playing with. So loans, obviously, um, at the moment they're given, they're not very costly for the, or they're not as costly as grants for the government, right? Because grants, I'm giving you $2,000, you don't have to repay it, but loans, you do have to repay it to the government. But what we were thinking about is, wouldn't it be interesting in a counterfactual if the loans are actually creating these uh, labor distortions and the size of the distortions is another reason why you would have this model right because you can actually aggregate these things up um, but wouldn't it be interesting is if by switching from loans to grants that immediate transition is more costly for the government 
but maybe it relieves these distortions and people actually are making more money throughout their lives and paying more in tax revenue. And so it actually is not quite as costly as maybe it seems to begin with. So that might be like kind of one counterfactual that would be interesting. Um, or we were thinking about making maybe occupation specific grants. So let's say our model tells us that the var fee k, which was like an occupation specific parameter, is especially steep for certain occupations. And those also are occupations where our estimates about the talent distribution show us that there's like a lot of distortions. Then you might come up and say, hey, well, you know, you might have occupation specific grants um, that would uh, like relieve this in like a more complex way. Um, and then I think that like we'd also take it in a totally different direction we were thinking about, which is kind of saying like how much of, you know, the rise in student debt over time is kind of maybe um, creating a compression of the college wage premium because that's kind of leveled off over time. You, college wage premium is like how much college graduates earn over high school graduates. And would this model or would this paper mechanism maybe say something about why that's leveled off a lot over time as student debt is growing and you also have kind of stagnation of this premium. So, so there's, yeah, the counterfactual is a whole nother lecture on how do you think of like, once you've done all the work, how do you think of a good counterfactual that will actually uh, be kind of insightful and interesting to do? And that's also um, kind of a fun thing to think about. I kind of had two two questions also about the papers. So I guess you're talking about counterfactuals. One would be to compare, I guess, if you had increased debt and you get go from high school to college, is it worth it? You know, you can make those mm -hmm. sort of, but is there any way to incorporate like non-linearities non that are kind of uh, like, you know, there's a threshold level where you get a college degree, whereas if you get a little bit of debt, but you don't finish the college degree, there's a huge difference. So. Ah, so kind of like the completion aspect of it? Yeah, is there an easy way to model that somehow? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So this is all comes into like modeling choices. So I showed you a stylized model. Um, the next one that we did was more of like a life cycle model. And it's again like a, like a, you have to at some point, I guess, you know, kind of decide what do you think is the most important mechanisms here. So you might look to the data and say, okay, what proportion of individuals is this? I think it's actually a pretty sizable proportion of people who like graduate with a lot of debt. They haven't actually finished school. So maybe that is something we should put in. But we were thinking about this, then you would need to add an extra period into your model, right? Which is kind of the choice of do I complete college or not? Um, it might even, I think we talked a little bit about maybe putting this in as almost additional occupational choice. Like it's almost another thing is like, I stay with my debt, but I just don't graduate with a degree or something like that. Um, but if you did put it in as a totally different, a totally additional step in kind of the decision-making process that we've modeled, because right now we kind of have like two steps, right? I kind of choose amongst occupations and within occupation I optimize. This would be another thing which is like now I'm in college and looking forward I do another optimization, optimization step. Yeah, I only asked that because I had read somewhere that a lot of the, the balloon in, in student debt was because was like a small amount of debt for people that didn't finish college. It's not like usually you think of like lawyers who have to get a lot of debt, but those people are actually totally fine. But it's really yeah. the, the small amount of debt for people that don't finish college that's the problem. Yeah, and a lot of uh, certain schools too. So like these for-profit schools, I think is like another big source of like the big debt people. Um, so I think, yeah, I think uh, we're trying to get uh, some data on what type of school people went to as well, because school quality is another thing that's kind of missing in our model. Um, and so that would be like another thing that maybe you would put in as another layer of heterogeneity on the school side or on that like H side of, um, rather than just on the borrow, because we have differences in ability, but it might interact with these different things. So I think that's like, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. 